Live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. All right, Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. The latest edition dropped this morning at 6 a.m. Get the next one at 6 a.m. Monday. Adam Kaplan is in the house. I feel like I haven't talked to Adam in like a year. And that's not just saying because it's 2021. It's been a while since I've been here. And an Adam Kaplan Football at Four segment has been on the same time. But welcome back, Adam. Mike, I now I haven't confirmed this, but there's a rumor you set a company record of most vacation weeks in six weeks. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, my goodness. It's funny because I usually break it up a lot, but I didn't take any vacation until December. Because oh, I know. And when I actually had a real job, I don't know, in the 18th century, um, I was told to take all my vacation weeks or I lo- would lose them by the end of the year. So I, I'm assuming that's what happened with you. Well, I mean, because of the uh, COVID situation, like people mm. can't come in the building and all that kind of sure. stuff. So I sure. kind of was, was, was forced to come in. Um, and then there's certain times of the year where the, I'm not allowed to take off. Um, so I had a strategic, I strategically have. So it, it fell into where I had all these days where I had to lose them. So uh, here I am. And what did you do, by the way, before we get started? What did you do on your time off there? I listened to Josh and Broads and Football at Four. Okay. There you go. And hopefully Inside the Birds. There no, you go. actually, and, and, and I did listen to the Inside the Birds podcast. We put it in a new bathroom at my house. Um, oh, nice. Did you? Uh, yeah, we redid the bathroom. We uh, were working on the back porch. We did some around-the-house stuff. You know, that guy's up, clean the gutters, yada, yada. And uh, here we are, 2021. Nice. Great to be back. There you go. <laughs> new Year. Happy New Year, guys. Yeah, we're, I'm glad to be back on the station and uh, – well, it's going to be a, a, a very interesting offseason, oh, yeah. one of the, mo- the most interesting we've had in years. Uh, I, you know, when you're bad, the good part about being bad is the off season is more interesting, right? I mean, you get a bad it's regular true. I can't season. deny it. It's helped our, it's our show numbers. I was just going to, uh, Jeff and I were exchanging some comments, blown away by the traffic we've gotten the last couple of days. I, we get it. You're absolutely right, Mike. You nailed that one. Uh, turmoil could trade, creates traffic when you have an Eagles podcast. No <laughs> doubt about it. It does. So let's start with this. Uh, obviously, the Eagles let go of Rich Gangarello, Marty Morningwig. They will not return. They were both on one-year deals. So let's start off with why. Why are these guys not coming back? Yeah, so here's my take. So with Gangarello, it was real simple. They After the two coaches were not retained last year, Mike Grow the OC, and Carson Walsh, uh, the wide receivers coach, but particularly with Grow, they wanted more innovation. This is coming from the owner, Jeffrey Lurie, to the, to the coaches and to Howie Roseman, the general manager. Uh, the owner wanted this to be a top-five offense. He wanted it to look like other teams. The Niners running the most pre-snap motion last season at 70%. That's a ton. That's a ton. You're talking about 70% of your offensive plays you're running pre-snap motion. The Eagles were down, near down the bottom with pre-snap motion. Now, since the Dallas game uh, this year, the Eagles were way up in pre-snap motion. But it, 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 whatever, for whatever reason, Mike, it didn't help. And as we reported on Inside the Birds exclusively, uh, after that Dallas game, the owner made his displeasure to the, to the offensive coaches, some of them, uh, that he was not happy with the direction of the offense. And there you go, uh, two coaches not retained. Uh, the big one, though, of the two would be Scangarello because he was the guy, okay? He was the guy that's supposed to come in here and bring in – Part of that Kyle Shanahan offense, and and also some of the some of the concepts with uh, the Sean McVay ran, and uh, unfortunately it didn't work out. And I know they were excited to bring him in because uh, the word around the league was he did a good job with the Broncos as OC. He had a disagreement, I'm told, uh, with their, their head coach Vic Fangio, and he was not retained. But here, listen, they were expecting a lot more, and they got less. Yeah, and uh, obviously the offense was a mess. Uh, they mentioned uh, too many voices in the room. Doug mentioned, I think he mentioned like five or six different things yeah, at that. the end of the year. <laughs> So yeah. you mentioned the reasons why they were hired, but do we definitively think they need to be replaced? You got Rich Scangarello, who was a senior offensive assistant coach, and Marty Morningway, who was an offensive consultant. None of these guys really called plays or did anything that anybody would deem all that important. Yeah, that's that's the point of this. So Marty, Marty, as I'm told, was working uh, with uh, Jalen Hurts uh, because of his experience with mobile quarterback Steve Young, uh, Michael Vick. Uh, Donovan McNabb and others, uh, so that's why he was brought in. And also, he's very close to Doug Peterson. They, they hold. They also have the same agent. Uh, but that. But he only got a one-year deal because he had what you would call an extraneous job, not non non essential. And then Scangarello got a one-year deal. Remember, he was still being paid by the Broncos, and the staff didn't know him, so they wanted to see how it worked, and it did not work out. So, I agree with your point. And and boy, talk about giving away the answers to the test. 
Doug Peterson gave it out in his, uh, his, his, his press conference, Mike, last Friday. He made it very clear in his words um, that he wanted one voice, which means he wanted to streamline the process. And Wernigweg and Scangarello were the results of that. Will there be an offensive coordinator in 2021? Hmm. This is probably the t- other than uh, whether they're going to trade Wentz or keep him. The, the question clearly is whether they're going to have an offense coordinator. My understanding from the talks this week is both sides understand the importance of it. Look, they try to hire uh, Hunter. They try to hire one last year. Uh, they talked to a, a bunch of guys. Uh, the big one was uh, Graham Harrell, the OC of uh, USC. Um, I'm told a uh, source close to him that the non-starter was Doug not giving, willing to give up plays. Uh, and unless Peterson's willing to give up plays, it's going to be hard for them to get somebody to leave a really good job where the calling plays, just to come to the NFL from college football, that's not what you want to do when you come from a top conference. Now, when you look at someone in the National Football League that's not with the Eagles, they certainly, there are certain guys that they could look at. But the, the thing is, most guys who call plays for are going to want to call it. So that brings us to Press Taylor and whether he will be the offense coordinator or not. I know a lot of people are asking about it, and we discussed it. Pretty, at, pretty much at length uh, in, this, in, the, in the Inside the Bird show that, that popped this morning. It's also you could see on YouTube if you want. But we discussed it. We put a lot of time into this one. We, uh, Mosher and I gave our strong opinions on that, and I really suggest that you listen. Yeah, well, um, it doesn't seem that that would be a very popular choice just staying No, it house. would not be. No, it would not be. Now, here's, uh, let me give you a Cliff Notes version, okay? I understand people have a lot of questions or, or, and have angst about it. We've been saying, guys, for, for – the last two months, particularly myself, how could you excuse this offense and these coaches for the regression of their top two quarterbacks? Wentz is obvious, and Nate Sudfeld has a two-year regression where he had not been active since week one prior to the week 17 game. So how in the world could you possibly justify or sell uh, this a potential promotion for him? Now, as I've said, and I'm not going to run away from it because I, you know, was I did say it. I did say that I, I didn't wasn't reporting it was an opinion. I I just felt strongly that you would ha- he would have to be reassigned based on the information that I've been gathering, and based on I know that Jeffrey Lurie's made it very clear that he was not happy with the offense. And by the way, Press Taylor is the highest ranking offensive coach other than Doug Peterson in terms of responsibility, and they had a bottom five offense, only four wins. And, okay, folks, did you see the reporting that the Inquirer had about Jeffrey Lurie left practice in disgust this season? I believe that's true. Uh, It's not a secret that this offense was a disappointment and ownership was disappointed. So I ask you guys, can you really sell Press Taylor as the offense coordinator? Your thoughts? Uh, um, It doesn't appear uh, on our Twitter mentions. I mean, about an hour ago, Sal Pal said he'd be beyond shocked if Press Taylor wasn't the coordinator, and of course, uh, people are responding to that tweet. I feel like uh, the computer is going to fall on my face. <laughs> the way, listen, look, Sal. Look, we know Sal knows Doug. I mean, Sal always puts that uh, that that awesome text. He used to do it before every game. Yep. Uh, maybe he has some intel, but what I'm saying is this. Oh, you're From right. A, it doesn't appear that that's sellable. Sell it. Yeah, you can't sell it. You just can't. But hey, I'm not Doug Peterson. I'm not Jeffrey Lurie or Harry Roseman. Okay, well, there's a lot of layers here. So let's let me. So the offense was bottom five. It was terrible. How much blame goes to Taylor and Peterson, and how much of that inside that building do they put on offensive line, injuries, Jackson gets hurt, Rieger missed time, Ertz missed time, Goddard missed time, Sanders missed time. You get what I'm saying. Mike, look, it's, they, they're well aware of the issues. They, they know the injuries are certainly a factor. But that has nothing to do with the play design or play calling. That's the problem. It's more play design than play calling. I think we kind of overrate that. Sometimes I think that we look at it and say, oh, it must be the play calling. Well, at first, it's the play design. And that, that has been a major, major problem, uh, you go, really, the, the entire season. So it, it's, it's got to get better. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, when you go, you know, we talked about the pre snap motion. Well, that, by the way, folks, that's put in the game plan. That that's done in the classroom environment, or obviously with the players over Zoom, and then in practice. But the fact of the matter is, the play design this season has been a major disappointment. Because when they fired Mike Grow, uh, you know, that came from the owner. It's not a secret. It's been well reported by us and and several other outlets. Uh, it's because Jeffrey Lurie was disgusted with the offense last season. Yeah, sure. Wentz 
Wentz was playing with street free agents at the, the final quarter of the regular season, did a great job. But when you look at the play design and structure, it's totally unacceptable, and that's, that's the way that everybody looks at it. It's not just injuries. It's way more than that. Well, how about this? When we look about the next coaching staff that's going to come in, you mentioned how Laurie stepped in with the Mike Grow. Do we know if Doug even has the power to hire the next coach, or is it going to be the, the owner in the front office again? Yeah, well, look, it, it, he controls – Doug, technically, Hunter, controls his own coaching staff is the way I understand, but that doesn't mean the owner who owns the, the business, the football team, can't say, listen, I don't agree with that. You know, I asked Joe Banner this before, Eagles president, and he explained it to me uh, a while back, uh, probably six or eight weeks ago, because we were just – I was asking about coaches' contracts and how it works. He says, listen, you know, let, let's say, I'm just giving you a scenario, okay? Let's say Peterson wanted to hire you know, someone from another team that doesn't have a great track record of offense, but it's a friend of his who he likes who we think he would work well with. The Eagles do the research, and, and particularly Roseman and Lori and others, and they look at it and say, you know what, this guy does not have a track record of success. And Lori doesn't agree with it, then they have an issue. Where Doug could say, "Listen, I want this guy in there. You know, I'm allowed to hire my own coaches with your approval. And if he do, if he disapproves, they'll look at the line. Doug, you know, would look at the language of the contract. I mean, that's just the way it works here. Um, I mean, look, I remember, I remember a, 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 a prime example of this back in '98 or '99. Vic Fangio was the Colts defensive coordinator. They went from a, they were going to move from a 34 to 43 defense." Jim Morris said, you can't fire him, and the Colts said, yes, we can, because he can't coach this defense. And Jim Moore, by the way, that's why he got fired. He, refu- he was not going down on the ship. Hmm. He stood up for his coach, which is commendable, but that cost him his job and others their job. So we'll see what happens here. I mean, Doug, look, they had their meetings this week. We'll see, what, uh, we'll see what Doug wants to do with his coaching staff and how Doug's going to rebound uh, going forward here. It's uh, been a tough season. I, I said this, guys, on our show uh, for the last couple of weeks. I'll admit it. I was wrong. I, I thought that at least this team should have been 8-8 eight eight with this roster, but I don't know about you guys. This team should have been way better than 4-11-1. I would agree uh, with that. Now, I want to get your take on this. Adam Kaplan from the Inside the Birds podcast, which, don't forget, drops Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 a.m. So listen to today's edition. They, they go a lot deeper into some of these topics. But one of the things is, you know, in 2012, they had four offensive linemen injured. The next year, they won 10 games. Now, Andy got fired. They brought Chip in. But you know, a lot of people say, wow, Chip was great. Well, he had those four offensive linemen back, and that really changed a lot for this team. Is getting Lane Johnson, Brandon Brooks, and that offensive line back in order, is that enough to take you from a four-win team to what you said? They could be like an eight-win team, and then they add a couple more pieces. You know, Is it that simple that just fixing that offensive line could change this team overnight? Yeah, and they also have there are five key linemen out. Yeah, if you look at all the guys that got hurt, but you know the problem is, Mike, if you look at Brandon Brooks, and I know he's done an unbelievable job of rehab, where he actually returned to practice uh, in week seventeen. He was never going to play, uh, come back from his torn Achilles, but that's just an amazing job and credit to him. And he's in great physical shape, but again, he's in his thirties. Lane Johnson, as he said, having his ankle re- rebuilt at thirty years old, uh, you don't know if he'll be the same this coming season. Um, you look at the – look, Jason Kelsey, he's still under contract. He's one more year left. He's signed through 21. Uh, talked to someone close to Jason this week. He, Jason is going to take some time off, try to figure out what he wants to do with his career. Um, uh, although I'm told Jason probably will go into coaching or something like that uh, after he's done. But, look, three starters over 30, that's not good. And they don't really have – by the way, other than Dillard and Mylotta, they don't have their, – their, their guys who could potentially start on the interior unless they move, say, Malo to center. Which, which could happen. He was drafted, by the way, to be Kelsey's replacement because Kelsey was not playing well at the time of that draft, um, the draft in 16, and then he turned his career around. So they got a lot of questions, Mike. Like, quite frankly, they got to get significantly younger this offseason. They know that, and I, I, I think they will attempt to do that. All right, uh, let's flip over to the defense because they need a coordinator on the defensive side of the ball. Um, there's so many questions here because this yeah, guy yeah. has power, right? He has yeah. the ability to really run the defense with nobody telling him what to do. So let's start with this. Is there an in-house candidate that is a safe guy that they don't have to bring in a guy from outside who wants to come in and really do what they want to do? They say, hey, this guy's been here. Let's stick with this guy because of the scheme that they have with the players that they have. Yeah, exactly. So it would be Matt Burke, who's a D-line coach, who's a gym Schwartz protege. That way, they'd be able to keep the wide nine. But we did report on last week, our last Sunday show, our pregame show, that they're not only not married to the wide nine; they're open to any potential 
defensive scheme, but the way it's explained to me by uh, team sources that they're not going to, Mike, just change the scheme because they want to change the scheme and, and, and the, the pieces don't fit. The scheme will have to fit the players they have. So right now the front is more for the wide nine front uh, where the ends are way out of the tackle box. But they're not, they're not opposed to changing it. So, for instance, they, they, you know, even if they don't go with Matt Burke or Marquan Manuel, who knows the, Atlanta, the uh, Seattle scheme, um, they could go outside, go for it, Gus Bradley. Or Joe Barry, by the way, is a terrific coach. He, he was a runner-up to be the defense coordinator with the Rams. He's their linebacker's coach and assistant head coach. There are plenty of, there are plenty of candidates on the outside they could bring in. Like that's the, it's funny, not that it's easy to fill a defense coordinator spot, it's not, but there are a lot of good names that are going to be available that, that were either uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're teams out of the playoffs or the coaching staff got fired or whatever, but it's going to be a little bit harder on offense because, as you, you know, you're talking about the D coordinator would have carte blanche here. He certainly would, but the offensive coordinator would not here if they go on the outside. How did you view the Jim Schwartz tenure? He takes a lot of heat. Of course, they did win the Super Bowl, but, you know, he plays the sticks, and he's not aggressive. He doesn't blitz. But ultimately, I think he held that team involved in a lot of situations. But it is a controversial uh, guy. He was, Hunter, because here's the thing. From the purest standpoint, you hate it that he doesn't like the blitz, and that's, you know, that the, the Jim Washburn, the father of the wide nine, he hated it, and that's where Schwartz learned the, the defensive front. So I, I would say mixed results. I would say... Good rather than bad. It's not just the the sticks defense. It's the biggest knock that Mocher and I found out from our sources for two years, and it's definitely true from around the league. Is if people would do advance work on on the Eagles because their 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 team was going to play them, would say, um, virtually say the same thing. Lack of pre snap disguise. Uh, if if you could hold up against their front four, you're going to win because their secondary is going to be under siege. The way you beat the Eagles is you always throw it. You don't come out running. That's the way you win, and that's what has happened in the last three seasons, particularly the last two, uh, and that, that's that been a problem. Um, that That's something that I would think that if they do not stick with uh, the, the wide nine front and if they go with a different scheme, a different 43 scheme or even go with a 34, I would expect it to be someone who's had really good success forcing turnovers. That's another part of Schwartz's defense. And I know Jim's been defensive about it, but it's an excuse. Talking to people who really know Jim's defense – it's absolutely an excuse, and that's that's the one real negative. It's a lack of turnovers. It's really not good. But if you look at the, except for this season, this season kind of uh, on a lower stand, uh, standpoint, but typically Schwartz's defense has finished very, very well and usually finished in the top ten in the important category, categories other than turnovers. All right, two in, uh, in-house candidates you mentioned. Anybody outside that the Eagles have connections to or would be intrigued by? Raheem Morris will be a great one. Now, he's had some head coaching interviews. He already interviewed for the uh, Falcons job. He was a D coordinator. Now he got promoted to interim head coach. He's very, very aggressive. He could run a variety of schemes, but his scheme is the Tampa 2, and he could also run uh, cover three uh, Seattle scheme. He would be a great one. He would, he would be the top guy in terms of guys who would be available. He would be terrific. Uh, Ted Montecchino, uh, who is the linebackers, outside linebackers coach for the Bears, the Eagles had interest in when he was with the Ravens. He could run a 34 or 43. Uh, he would be really good. Uh, 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 Aaron Glenn, I absolutely love, who's a DB's coach of the Saints, who's getting a couple of head coach interviews. He's terrific. Former long-term cornerback. You remember, might remember him with the Jets. Uh, he'd be great. Also, I'm told he's had two years of scouting experience on the pro and college level. So that would help the Eagles a little bit. It's always good to tie up the, the scouting with the coaches. So there, there are plenty of names. Again, defensive coordinator is not a problem. The big one is going to figure out what they're going to do with the offensive coordinator uh, position, and my understanding is they definitely want to fill it just about how they're going to do it. There you go, a little synopsis of uh, the beginning of this offseason and, of course, the sixth pick in the NFL draft. We'll start to dive into that as well because a very controversial thought in Philadelphia, uh, Adam, would be drafting a linebacker at number six. Oh, my if you goodness, look at, Armageddon. If yeah. you look at mock drafts, there's a linebacker going at number six in just about every single one of them. So maybe they bucked that trend for the first well, time. Yeah, but again, is that an, a, 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 an outside linebacker pass rusher? Like, you gotta, you just got to define exactly what kind of linebacker it is because I highly doubt the draft of true linebacker. Parsons is not a true linebacker. He's just not. Yeah. He's a pass rusher. I mean, right. he's, he's more than that. He's just more than – he's a great player, but he's not a pure – okay, he's a pure linebacker. I don't see it that way. And again, the Eagles have not done it in decades, so it's, it's hard to see them doing it. 
There he goes. Uh, of course, uh, Adam Kaplan inside the birds, the inside the birds podcast. It dropped this morning. Make sure you uh, get your birds fixed every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It drops at 6 a.m. And right here during football at four on the sports bash. Thank you, Adam. Guys, thank you.